The topic is something that gets brought up a lot in internet conversations when it comes to basically anything. Films, movies, video games, TV shows, just basic real life stuff about politics, cars, fruit, just... The whole opinion clashing against opinion is an everlasting thing of just human society well before the internet even existed. However, there's something that is never really brought up in these kinds of conversations, and it's actually something that's frowned upon in the recent internet age. And that is the, the fact that opinions on something can actually change. And just by saying that, I think I'm already giving away uh, what I think about Iron Man 3 right here right now and I know that probably some of my people who actually have frequented my YouTube channel from beginning from from, the, from its inception or from the Iron Man 3 bitching and moaning days they're probably going to be surprised by what I'm going to have to say about this movie um, but it, the, but the reason why I mentioned that whole opinion thing is because it's just this weird internet thing where people are surprised that opinions can change and this is even something that's kind of infected me too where as I was watching this movie I was like am I actually kind of digging this movie am I, am I understanding what the movie is about now have, have these three years of just distancing myself from this movie allowed me to appreciate what it's going for instead of bitching of, about what I thought it should be and that is kind of precisely what happened and the reason why I've decided to go back to rewatching Iron Man 3 and to sort of reevaluate my own opinions on the film is because of Batman v Superman because that is a movie that is being blasted all over the place that is being debated on that is being torn down all over the place because a lot of people had very strong feelings about Man of Steel a lot of people had very strong feelings about what a Man of Steel sequel should be should it just be a Superman movie should it be a Batman Superman team up movie is it okay to make it a Batman Superman versus film and how do you do a team up movie how do you do a solo Man of Steel sequel a lot of people had a billion different directions to go with for Batman v Superman and the marketing of, the, of that particular film didn't help matters and such you have a situation that while it isn't as extreme as what happened to Iron Man 3, I still think that comparing Iron Man 3 and calling it sort of the Batman v Superman of the MCU, I don't think I'm being too... Um, I don't think I'm making a, a stretch here by paralleling these two movies and drawing comparisons to how people expected them to be and how they negatively reacted to what they ultimately were. And there are still a lot of people that really, you know, don't like Iron Man 3, that still really, really hate it. But after having a big debate about the quality of Batman v Superman, I decided to go back and rewatch Iron Man 3 because as I was hearing what the, these people were saying about these guys who didn't like the movie, how they had these ideas for what the movie should be and how the marketing and excitement kind of swept them up, in, into the hype train, I decided, I realized that that's what I did for Iron Man 3. I had uh, lots of really strong ideas of what the film should be. I felt that the marketing was very misrepresentative of the finished product, which I thought was something that was also a problem for Batman v Superman, which is going to probably plague that movie for at least another 5 to 10 years, and I think that's going to be this uh, plague Iron Man 3 as well for another 5 to 10 years. And after taking... A good long while to actually think about why I hated the movie before rewatching it. I was like, why did I hate this movie again? Like, I, I vaguely remembered some creative decisions that I didn't like, and I still don't like quite a few of them still after rewatching it. But after rewatching this film, I actually really kind of dig it. Um, I would actually give it like a solid seven out of ten. Like, it's somewhere around the same ballpark as Age of Ultron, where it has a lot of really cool ideas it has some really good performances in it and some really good action set pieces but i feel like a lot of the connective tissue that really expands on these ideas is not really there and some of the complaints that i had about the film from beforehand are still applicable to the rewatch like the tone and the mandarin twist although the mandarin twist is a little bit different for me here and i'm not sure if i still wholly dislike it like I did before, but I'm going to get into that later on. Um, basically, what this movie is, and what a lot of people really don't realize it, is that this movie is kind of an examination of American society post-9-11. Because this movie really takes you into the whole military-industrial complex. It shows you how one man's ambition can manipulate 
uh, the, the post 9-11 world to suit his own needs because after 9-11, you know, America has always been a very veg afraid of terrorists. It's been kind of become a global problem as well. And you have the media constantly talking about terrorists doing this, terrorists doing that, and how the media who are, you know, informing us about these attacks are also spreading this kind of widespread fear into us, putting the fear of God of terrorists into us. And then, as I was watching this movie, and I was realizing what Aldrich Killian is doing with the fake Mandarin and what his whole plan is, he is basically manipulating post-9-11, you know, mentality to suit his own purposes. Like, he cre he combines, you know, Saddam Hussein, Osama bin Laden, and all of these other famous, or rather infamous, uh, terrorist figures, and he mates, and he creates the ultimate terrorist figure in them through the Mandarin, this guy who embodies everything that Americans think terrorists are and what they're afraid of, and he uses this fake Mandarin to escalate the war on terror. And as the war on terror is escalating, the military-industrial complex is escalating too. He is creating both supply and demand. Uh, demand through the fake Mandarin who he controls and supply by showing people the power of extremists and then as the war on terror is going to escalate as things are going to get crazier and crazier and crazier Aldrich Killian thanks to his anonymity is going to just be able to sit back and watch the whole world burn while he just makes a shitload of cash off of it and this is something that you really couldn't do before 9-11 and this whole movie really is an, a pretty cool examination of not post 9-11 society and how this whole f war on terror thing uh, has affected society and how one man is able to manipulate this society and the way it thinks about these certain topics to serve his own purposes. And I think the scariest thing about Killian is that Killian doesn't really have any sort of personal stake in this. Like, he is just about the money. He is just about using this whole situation to his own personal benefit, but he understands the psychology and the ideologies of the people he's manipulating enough to basically manipulate them. So he has no real ideology except personal gain, but he understands all the sides that are involved in this big war on terror to manipulate them, and that's kind of pretty cool, uh, and that's a pretty cool element of Killian's character and his overall plan. And then you have Iron Patriot, who everybody bitches and moans about Iron Patriot being like this, uh, being like this stupid gimmicky thing, but that's kind of the point of Iron Patriot. Well, they also complain about Iron Patriot because it's not Norman Osborn, and they're like, oh, well, when you do Dark Reign, how are you going to bring back Iron Patriot? But the whole thing about Iron Patriot is that he is... Though he is the Battle of Yonkers for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Now, the Battle of Yonkers is from World War Z, not the movie, the book. It's a really awesome book about a realistic take on the zombie apocalypse. And the reason why I'm paralleling these two events is that both of these things are nothing but ineffectual American grandstanding. They're nothing but stupid gimmicks that are supposed to, you know, uh, feed into the whole America, fuck yeah, bullshit that we all complain about Americans having, and he, and he is completely useless. Like, even in the film, everybody makes fun of him. Nobody takes him seriously. Like, he is nothing but this big, generic, murka fuck yeah patriotic bullshit marketing gimmick who is completely useless and ineffectual throughout the entire movie. And that's a pretty scathing critique on those sorts of gimmicks that Americans have used and, and lots of other countries have used to sort of inspire their people and make them feel safer. Um, but, but what I think really works about the movie after re-watching it is Tony Stark's character arc. Now, before I used to complain that Tony Stark is barely in the armor and there's no real good reason for it uh, besides they just didn't want him in the armor. And Tony's whole thing is that Tony is using the armor is like a cocoon. He is so fucked up after the Avengers that he has, feels the need to create dozens upon dozens of armors to make, him, to make himself feel safer. But it, it's only like barely working. It's, it's keeping him occupied. It's keeping him from really dealing with his PTSD. And throughout the entire movie, Tony feels like he is useless without the armor. Tony feels like in this world where he can't even outfight Black Widow or Hawkeye or Captain America without the suit, and, and even in the suit he's useless against guys like Hulk and Thor, he feels ineffectual. And that's why he builds all of these armors one on top of what one another. He feels like he needs 
to create armors to make himself feel worthwhile in this world where gods and aliens and monsters and all sorts of this freaky shit exists to compensate for the fact that he is just a dude in a big metal suit that, that, that can be taken apart like in two seconds uh, under in, in a battle against a guy like uh, Thor or Hulk. But as the film progresses and Tony isn't in the armor, Tony actually comes to the realization that he is not Iron Man because of the suit. He is Iron Man because he's Tony Stark. He is capable of all these things because of his own natural abilities. He, it's not the suit that makes him Iron Man. Like, he just is Iron Man regardless if he has the suit or not. And the way the film really sells you on this is because it spends so much time with Tony outside the suit. It spends so much time showing Tony kick lots of ass just using his brains and smarts and his apparent martial arts training that kind of comes out of nowhere, but whatever, it's cool, so shut up. Um, and because Tony spends like the entire middle portion of the film without the armor and just doing all sorts of cool shit without the armor, that's what makes him realize that no, the suit does not make the man. I am the man every single day, every minute of my life. The man, the Iron Man, or so to say, is nothing but a tool that just lets me do everything I can already do, except better. But I am already awesome on my own, and that's why I don't need to be so afraid anymore. Now, and, and that's why t when Tony says his, that's why one of Tony's final lines is so poignant in the movie when he says, I am Iron Man. It's because he is Iron Man regardless if he has the suits or not because he is so smart, because he is so capable without the suit. It's just that the Iron Man suits let him do everything he can do, but better, faster, and more efficiently. They're nothing but a tool. They do not define him as a person. And that's why I think the Tony Stark's arc throughout the movie really, really works. Um, it still doesn't work with Age of Ultron because... The whole movie plays itself like Tony's not afraid anymore, like Tony's not going to be paranoid about alien, aliens and monsters and Norse gods anymore. And that doesn't make any sense with Age of Ultron, and, that, and that's kind of where Age of Ultron and Iron Man 3 mutually hurt one another, where Iron Man 3 is really like Tony going into retirement, like this is Tony's like swan song. And then Iron Man 3, then Age of Ultron just kind of pulls him out of retirement with the Iron Legion back, with him being out on the field again, and him being afraid of Norse gods and monsters and aliens and all that shit. And the two movies do not really still fit together really, really well, which is a problem with the film. Um, but uh, <coughs> the, Iron, the Mandarin twist is actually kind of cool, but also still kind of annoys me, um, because it's kind of a metatextual thing, because... Ben Kingsley really sells the scenes he, he's in as the fake Mandarin. Like, he is so convincing in the trailers and in the fake videos and the actual movie itself that you are so... that, you're, that you actually buy into all of the stuff he's saying that you want him to be the real Iron Man. And that's kind of where the movie gets kind of crazy in a metatextual way because we, as comic book fans we really get into this shit. Like, we really get into this entertainment that is essentially dudes in big, flashy special effects who don't really give a shit about this stuff half as much as we do, just acting like they do. And it is because these guys, these performers, make such a convincing performance out of playing these characters that we all really, really like and want to see in live action, coupled with the special effects and the budget and the marketing, we all buy into this stuff. We all care about these things that have no real influence on our real lives. And when you see that Aldrich Killian is using that kind of Kevin Feige-esque shit to convince the people in the movie and outside the movie about how awesome the fake Mandarin is, that creates this sort of fucking crazy metatextual thing that I didn't even realize beforehand. And that's why I kind of think that on one hand, th that, that the Mandarin twist really, really works. It's like, it's kind of like a fucked up Kevin Feige version if Kevin Feige ever decided to become a James Bond villain and control the war on terror. It, it's really crazy. It's really creative in a metatextual way. And it's almost something like Grant fucking Morrison would do. Except it's not as crazy as Grant Morrison. Like, Grant Morrison would do a lot crazier than this. But it is some weird metatextual thing that I never really expected to see in a big $200 million movie like this, especially based on a superhero. 
Uh, but then, on the other hand, I do have a problem with the fact that why Trevor does this. Like, uh, Trevor just does this for cocaine. And I'm not saying that Trevor isn't fun, but Trevor doing this just for cocaine seems like a big waste of time. And I feel like if Trevor actually believed in the stuff that he's saying as the Mandarin, if he actually had real personal stakes in this and his being acting like a jackass was just him acting as a double fake out to fake out the audience and Tony Stark to save his own life. And then we got a revelation later on in the film where Trevor Slater says that, yeah, I actually believe in this stuff. I was only acting like a jackass so you wouldn't blow my brains out immediately upon seeing me. And I think if they did it that way, they could have had the jokey Trevor Slatery, but they also could have shown people that, in spite of this being a fake-out, the actor performing this role actually really does care about the material, and that this material does matter something to him. And I do feel like this is one of those instances where the movie is doing something just for the sake of a joke, and it ends up hurting itself really, really, a, really, a lot, basically. It really does hurt the movie, and I think that if the Mandarin twist was played a little bit more seriously, I think a lot less people would have been pissed off at that because I just did make an excuse for why the Mandarin twist works, but a lot of people aren't gonna wa are going to watch this movie. They're not going to realize it, so I think that giving them uh, giving them a double fake-out to go back from, from serious to joke to serious I think would have helped a lot of people accept the twist and not immediately dismiss the entire movie as a piece of crap just based on the twist. And I did say a lot of cool things about Aldrich Killian's plan, but Aldrich Killian as a character just is a big load of nothing for me. Like, the stuff he does is really, really interesting, but we don't know enough about this guy as a person to really get invested in him as a character. He's cool as kind of like an antagonist, as an adversary for Tony, but as his own character, he's not really that interesting for me. And the movie doesn't do enough with him as a person to make me think that he is like an amazing villain or whatever, like some fans of Iron Man 3 say he is. And then there's the stuff with, with Maya Hansen, which, which is obviously very undercut, because Maya Hansen's whole thing is that she's someone who sold her soul to work on this extremist thing, and it cost her her soul because she is an innocent scientist who had these big, grand, optimistic, you know, aspirations in the world. And then as she works for Aldrich Killian, he basically destroys this for her and she creates, you know, direct parallels between herself and the guys who made the atom bomb. Like that the guys who made the atom bomb and Project Manhattan, they didn't go into science thinking they were going to create the atom bomb. Like, they wanted to genuinely improve society through other means. It's just that life took them in this particular direction, and it cost them their souls. And that's a pretty cool idea that really resonates for Aldrich Killian and Iron Man, but she doesn't really get enough screen time in the movie for me to care about her as a character. And the way she just delivers the big theme about herself it's basically just in one conversation. I don't think that the film properly builds up to it or pays that off enough for me to think that it works and it's fully fleshed out. And the final battle is kind of is really boring for me. Um, I know a lot of people, a lot of Iron Man fans, even the guys who hate the movie, still really like the final battle. I still really don't like it because it, there's nothing really interesting choreography-wise going on. Um, like I said, Killian is not good enough of a villain for me to want to see Tony kick his ass. And I really feel like during that final battle, the movie's interesting social and political commentary just comes to a screeching halt. And then it's basically like, okay, we, we, we've reached the final act. we got to uh, do nothing with the characters, with the themes, with the ideas. Let's just beat the shit out of each other for 30 minutes and then, bring, uh, then make the, uh, the people who get what this movie is going for uh, give them more stuff that, they're care that they'll care about at the very end with the whole speech about how Tony is Iron Man with or without the suit. And I'm not, and I'm not even saying like the movie is, it looks bad or whatever, and I'm not, I'm not saying that the, the final battle looks bad. It's just that it doesn't inform the story. It's just a fight scene there for a big climactic fight scene, and it doesn't mean anything. It's just there for big MCU final battle reasons and it doesn't do anything in service of the storyline it basically i even think really does end up hurting the movie at the end um what else uh, 
The score, like I said, I still don't think the score is particularly great, but that's just kind of an MCU problem. I will say that this is not a generic-looking MCU movie because Shane Black is a pr pretty experienced director. Um, he knows how to do action scenes, and I really think that he is one of the stronger uh, directorial voices in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and the way he's able to keep things visually consistent with the big MCU films, with the bigger universe, I mean, but still create a film that still feels distinctly different from all of those other movies, including the first two Iron Man films, I think is a big testament to his ability. Um, I think a lot of the jokes really work in the movie, even though I do think they become really, really obnoxious when they're in scenes that I feel like they don't need to be in. And I'm still not crazy about the kid. I mean, the kid, the kid's whole thing about how Tony gets over PTSD kind of pisses me off still because Tony builds armors for months and months and months on end, and then when he has another uh, panic attack, uh, the kid basically tells him, well, why don't you just build something and that doesn't really make sense because, t like I just said, Tony spent months and months and months building shit. And that's why his whole just build something thing doesn't work. Uh, some people say that that's supposed to be Tony Stark as a kid, you know, lo looking for his absentee father. But that's not built up enough either for me. So, yeah. So, there are still uh, elements in this movie where I'm like, I don't really like this. I just, I just don't think there's enough here for me to work or I just don't agree with the way they do some things. But ultimately, I do think that this is a movie that has a lot of really interesting things to say. And I would even say that this movie is even more political than Winter Soldier because when I compare this, what this movie says about, about American society and the war on terror to what uh, Winter Soldier says about surveillance, Winter Soldier looks like a, six, uh, like a Saturday morning cartoon in comparison to this, which is a big compliment to the film. Um, although I will say that I still think Winter Soldier is still overall a considerably better movie than this. Like, if I had to rank the, the MCU movies, I would still say that Winter Soldier is, you know, the absolute peak with First Avenger right up there too, and then Daredevil Season 1 and Jessica Jones kind of I at the top. And then at, at, at the tier beneath those, I would probably put this, Iron Man 1 and Age of Ultron in that space. Like, they're not in the top 10 or rather the top five MCU things ever. But I do think that these are pretty strong movies that with extended cuts or with some alterations to the script could have become significantly better. And I think it's actually kind of baffling how this movie made like almost as much money, if not more money, than The Avengers. And nobody fucking talks about it. Everyone's like, oh yeah, and, and, and the Iron Man sequels fucking suck. Um, but honestly, I would actually say that as a movie, I think this is the best Iron Man movie, just technically wise. Even though I do think that Iron Man's Iron Man One and Two are considerably, considerably more memorable than this movie. And I think that's kind of one of the biggest problems with Iron Man Three is that it's not a particularly memorable movie for me, even after I've started to like it more and more and more after rewatching it. And I think that if you're going to create a movie like this that's going to talk about these kinds of issues and stuff, becoming forgettable is kind of a problem that will haunt you for a good long time. But who knows? Maybe if I rewatch this movie a couple more times as the years go by and I start, you know, picking up more things that work, maybe I'm going to put this in, like, the top five MCU things ever. Um, I already like it considerably better than I did three years ago. And I am actually really glad to see something from the MCU that, while it didn't come out this year, didn't piss me the fuck off like Civil War or most of Daredevil Season 2. So yeah, if you're one of those guys who hated Iron Man 3, have you gone back to that movie? Have you rewatched it? Do you still hate it? Do you, do you like it? Uh, what do you feel about it? Um, are you pissed off that I'm not one of those fuck Iron Man 3 guys again, even though I'm 90% sure that any any same person who was still with me back then probably jumped, got the fuck away from here ages ago. But yeah, uh, I hope I got, I hope I open you guys up to, you know, maybe reevaluating this movie if, if you didn't uh, care for it before. And what is one movie that you guys used to really, really hate that you've kind of come around on after taking a few years of stepping away from it and just uh, cooling off from your initial disdain of it.